only there's one up here. Because I feel bad that you're all sitting. Okay, fine. I'm over it now. Thank you, Adlon. She was so nervous. I don't know why. We just had a lovely dinner where I learned all about Botswana, so I don't understand quite what the nervousness was about. All these people. All these people. You see, my thing is, I don't usually get to see you all either. Just the camera. So it's kind of a treat for me to be here at Gettysburg and actually look you in the eye. I, I have a formal speech here. I'm going to read most of it, but I would really like to stop at some point. Somebody will give me the high sign and tell me when to stop. Because I'd love to take your questions. And that's what I learned um, I, as I go to college campuses, which I do a fair amount of. And as I travel this year talking about my book, I've had the most interesting learning experiences by hearing the questions people have come to ask. So that's what I'm really here to do. Um, I've had the opportunity to travel all over the country to talk about this book and to talk about I don't know, to provide some sort of rough translation about what it all means in Washington, especially now in the age of Obama. Uh, the presidency has changed what it looks like and what it feels like to cover Washington. But try as I might, I haven't been able to, to shake a, a creeping suspicion I have, especially when I show up in rooms like this, the standing room only crowds, the excitement. I am convinced you think I'm Queen Latifah. <laughs> See, now you just gave yourselves away. <laughs> She's actually quite a lovely woman. She can play me any time. <laughs> Especially if the other option is Keenan Thompson. <laughs> or on the other hand, I can believe all the worst things that have been written about me. Depending on what you read or what you Google me or Wikipedia me on, you'll hear that I'm either in Barack Obama's uh, hip pocket or I was in Sarah Palin's hip pocket, and it's hard to see how that would quite work, especially since the debate had moderated. Last I checked, Barack Obama wasn't on the stage, but you know, things are the way they are. Truth to tell, after what it feels like years of having covered, actually has been years of having covered healthcare reform, I'm simply happy to get out of Washington for a minute, just to find out what people are saying, how you translate what you see, and to get a better grip on what is driving our nation, and often on college campuses, what is driving our young people who are picking up the hope when we leave off, especially these public policy folks I've been talking to here at Gettysburg who are incredibly sharp and all looking for jobs if anyone has them. <laughs> so I'll speak for a few minutes and stop and hear your questions, and I'll tackle anything on your mind with this caveat. I'm not a pundit. I will not tell you my opinion about what I think, uh, because I try jealously to guard it and not to actually have it most of the time. It, it gets harder and harder for me to get out of Washington. Um, it gets harder and harder for me to answer questions. It gets harder and harder for me to get on college campuses because everywhere you look, there is so much to say. There are earthquakes and fires and uprisings in Kyrgyzstan, which I knew nothing about until this time yesterday, which is why I've been told someone I love my job. I arrive in the work in the morning and know nothing about Kyrgyzstan. By that night, I'm an expert. <laughs> But when you go through all of this, and then you go through something as, up, as incredible as elections, uh, elections that matter, elections that are consequential, as we're going to see again this fall with the midterm elections, you understand that chaos can be more than just natural disaster. It can be chaos of the political sort. And I love it. I love being caught up in the middle of it all. I get to <laughs> indulge my junkie-like addiction to politics, which is quite deep. But I also get to ask all the questions that I like. And I get to do it in a way that takes me and I hope you beyond a simple sound bite. On Washington Week and on the News Hour with Jim Lehrer, we approach the news with a fairly simple premise. We assume that you, this is novel, so pay attention. <laughs> we assume that you can decide what you think. And that all we have to do is provide you the information and the tools to think with. We're not fair and balanced in that sense. We really think you know. We assume that we're not going to be ever confused with cable television. We hope that you never know our opinions or that we ever reach any personal conclusions at all. But we believe that you are hungry to know that the rigors of daily night life have not so completely consumed you that it's obliterated your need for information that goes beyond the end of your nose. I covered my first presidential election in 1988. Um, that was working for the Washington Post where I was the young one on the totem pole, and they would always send me out to cover the candidates who were about to lose. Which meant that when they saw me coming, it was not a happy day. <laughs> <laughs> the only one who would refuse to lose was Jesse Jackson that year. And he stayed in the, in the, in the primary 
competition right up and through the Democratic National Convention that nominated brilliant Lily Michael Dukakis. And the interesting thing I discovered about covering uh, Jesse Jackson then, and then flash forward 20 years later, covering Barack Obama, was that even though he doesn't get the credit he did for it, Jesse Jackson in so many ways laid the groundwork. He won 13 pro pro contests that year. He showed it was possible to cross all kinds of barriers to vote for someone who was so much not like you. The same thing so many people did this year. So it was interesting. It was challenging. Um, it was, I uh, still have the scars to show for the fact it was the most disorganized campaign I've ever covered. <laughs> but it was nothing like the presidential campaign we just experienced. Um, and, and I never covered Washington at the time in my 25 years there when so much has all seemed to be at stake all at once. Um, and the toughest thing for all of us is sorting through all the noise so you don't lose sight of the fact that history is being made. On every day, any given day, it can be tempting to get swallowed up in the rush, in the rush of news and of blogging and of commentary, and, and about some of them about nothing, but a lot of it about important issues, poverty and pain, deficits, bailouts, joblessness, health care, all consequential issues, which to fill my de definition of news, which is it's gotta be about something that affects people's lives. Politics has got to be about something more than people yelling at each other. It's got to be about something that affects you. But in my business, as you well know, we are all too often consumed with debates of a far more base variety over American flag pins, over the lack thereof, over what I call shiny, phony balloons. Remember when the kid was supposed to be up with the balloon? We have this way where we, we get so distracted so easily by the littlest thing that just happened. A couple of weeks ago, we were completely caught up with a guy named Eric Massa, congressman from upstate New York we'd previously never heard about, but we couldn't stop talking about this guy. Now, a few weeks late, have passed, and I forget why we were so interested. It's like in, it's like in the movie Up, where the dog, talking dog, my favorite character in that movie. He, first of all, the idea that a dog was talking was quite remarkable, right? But just when he was talking to you, every now and then, he goes, squirrel! <laughs> and he loses train of thought. <laughs> we do that. We do that in Washington. Just give us one cheating spouse and we're gone. <laughs> Plus, thanks to Jon Stewart and Saturday Night Live, it has become downright entertaining to focus on the silliest aspects of what it takes to run for president and then, more difficultly, to govern well. Now, it should be said, I love Jon Stewart. I, I watch him whenever I can stay awake long enough. But one of the things I like best about him is he knows what he does and he knows what I do. In fact, when people say they only watch Jon Stewart, I realize that the best answer is, who do you think Jon Stewart watches? <laughs> <laughs> the other thing I like about Jon Stewart, or his brand of humor at least, is that in order to get the joke, you have to have the information. You have to know who Nancy Pelosi is and before you understand why the joke is funny. And you have to figure out it, it's an informed kind of humor, which the downside is sometimes it may mean that we end up mocking everything that we hold dear, but most of the time it means that we ought to be paying closer attention. I was visiting another college not too long ago, and I saw that in, in the information that went out in advance, I was described as a noted Beltway journalist, which of course is exactly what I've striven not to be all these years, <laughs> which is why I come out of the Beltway, just to prove it to myself. But I've gotten used along the way to used to being boiled down. When I was writing my book, <laughs> The Breakthrough of Politics and Race in the Age of Obama, available to bookstore near you, I became, I became identified, or if you're at Gettysburg College, for free. I, I, um, I became identified as an Obama booster by people who didn't know what the book was who didn't realize it wasn't solely about Barack Obama. And in fact, by people who never then or now read the book. This happened conveniently just before I moderated a vice presidential debate. Hmm. <laughs> That's okay. They, what, freak, what I realized was freaking a lot of people out is that I was writing a book about this, that was dealing with the subject of race. And all it took was to have a black person writing about race to completely discombobulate people. In other words, that meant that I was somehow going to write a sympathetic book. Now, in other venues, I'm boiled down to other things, some correct, some incorrect. If you judge me simply by my bio, you could also brand me as an activist, but an activist on behalf of immigrants because my parents were born in other countries, or free speech because I'm a journalist who believes in the First Amendment, or women's rights because I'm a woman. 
or red lipstick because I wear it. You can decide that I am an activist. And some of that would be true and some of it would not be. But there's one, one description that I have actually come to embrace belatedly and it is that of a leader. I got my undergraduate degree at Simmons College in Boston, women's college, and one that taught me a lot about how to function in an environment where the words woman and leader are not in conflict. When I was in college there in the 1970s, it was all about discontent and challenge. We picketed, we protested, we imagined ourselves to be terribly, terribly serious. We grimaced, we groused, and even if we didn't always get what we demanded, learning to speak up turned out to be a critical part of an education that shaped us for the rest of our lives, which is a good thing. I don't know a black woman or probably not any woman who hasn't had to deal with extraordinary challenges in the country where neither blackness or femaleness is particularly prized. Being underestimated is the daily price of admission. But I have to say, even though my father uh, was not exactly a feminist, he was a preacher who really wasn't crazy about women in the pulpit, for instance. He did manage somehow to raise two accomplished daughters, accomplished sons, but more surprisingly, accomplished daughters. And he did it by forgetting to tell us there was anything we couldn't do. He told all of his children the same thing and then was shocked that we took him seriously. <laughs> My father, like every other preacher who was ever alive in the 1960s, by the way, marched in civil rights rallies that, he, that Dr. King led, or at least they all say they did. I believe he did. He taught us that we had responsibilities. He taught us that these responsibilities were to our country and to our God and to ourselves. He taught us that if anyone ever heard, hurled the word, and keep in mind, this is the 1960s, black at us, it was considered a slur at the time, we were still Negroes, you may recall. We were supposed to respond by saying, thank you. It seems weird, but you know, it really worked. I found that if you said thankful, thank you to someone who thought they were insulting you, it would reduce them to silence. And there was, no, there was nothing more to be said, and you could just go about your merry way. It still works, by the way, I try it. And I recommend you try it if someone, someone throws something at you, but you know, make sure there's no punches thrown. When I research, was researching my book about black political breakthroughs, I was surprised to discover that many of them had experiences just like that. And that they, the sim, they also had similar responses. And that how you respond when someone attempts to slur you or to diminish you is also a sign of leadership. We are preachers kids, so we had other um, challenges as well. Expectations were high. But now we've come to realize how lucky we were to have people who placed high expectations on us, especially when we witness the havoc around us, which is often reached by low expectations. Now, I suspect none of us would probably be here, and, it, and certainly among you students here, you wouldn't be here if your parents hadn't set high expectations for you, whether it was your parents, your guardians, whoever cared enough about you to catch a glint of your possibilities. It's the striving for possibility that fueled the ambitions of people and heroes of mine like Harriet Tubman who saw the possibilities in escaping slavery or Sojourner Truth who saw the possibilities of what women could add to a national conversation <coughs> or Martin King who saw the possibilities of how equal access and simple justice could transform a nation. And because of those who have gone before me, I remain committed to the things that these people taught me were important. It is why I am a journalist actually. And it's how I came to believe that the search for truth and the search for justice are not incompatible. In fact, they are essential. My parents taught me never to take no for an answer, which came in handy when I started my career. My first job, I found a note left on my workspace one day when I was an intern that said, nigger go home. Now, you should understand, I, I did not grow up with this language in my household, so I wondered who this note was for. <laughs> Turns out my bosses knew who it was for and they offered me a job. So, gets you in the door, it doesn't keep you there. This same response to the world came in handy when I would interview people like the mayor of Baltimore who would bristle when I asked him tough questions and told me I acted like a school teacher, which I, to this day, still haven't figured out where the slur was supposed to be in that. It came in handy when Washington Post editors tried to kick me to the curb, and later on, New York Times editors did the same thing. I knew I was better than they thought at that time, and I knew no career worth having wasn't worth fighting for. All these old bosses, by the way, most of the white men, of course, now take happy credit for my career. <laughs> and I let them. 
And it came in handy when vice presidential candidates, this is in 2004, not 2008, told me they were <laughs> shocked, shocked to learn that black women were suffering from skyrocketing rates of HIV infection. And it came in handy when Dick Cheney in that same debate told me he couldn't answer a question in the 30 seconds he was given, and I told him he had no choice. <laughs> it came in handy when I walked into that other debate in 2008, and everyone was focused on Sarah Palin, who, by the way, one might notice didn't actually get elected vice president. People forgot Joe Biden was on the stage. I got hundreds of emails from people telling me the questions I should ask Governor Palin, and none asking me what I should ask Joe Biden. But I remain focused on getting both candidates to answer the questions. And all of this comes in handy when I talk to young girls, young people, young girls especially. I tell them what it takes to reach for the stars and how to stay focused on that. I tell them what I've learned along the way, to be curious, that there are no dumb questions, even though they can be poorly phrased. I tell them to learn how to write and how to challenge authority in a way that doesn't get them kicked out. And I tell them something no one ever told me, which is that you probably can't have it all at the same time. I have a little flat spot on the front of my head from banging my head against walls throughout my career. I imagine many of you know what I'm talking about. You're trying to break down walls. You're trying to force diversity of thought and opinion and ideas onto the air or into the print. And some weeks some more successful than others. But when I look at television news, so often I realize that sadly it looks the same way it looked when I was a nine-year-old girl. And it, that was nearly, well, it was a while ago. <laughs> <laughs> I was reminded of this once when I was speaking at a Southern University and there was a black woman in the audience there who told me that um, she wanted to know why there weren't more dark-skinned women on the air, like me. And, and I said to her, you know, I was kind of insulted by the question because, you know, some of my best friends are light-skinned black people. <laughs> I objected to this, and I, and I told her that, and she took me aside afterward, and she said, I have to tell you why I asked you that question. It's because my daughter sees you on TV, and she never gets to see anyone who looks like her. I began to understand along the way, as I've become, as I've traveled the country and met more people, that everyone is trying to find their place. Now, I still don't play self-destructive games about color. I think that's distracting. But I, I do know that we have this real complicated issue with race in this country, intraracially as well as interracially, which seems kind of odd because we have an African American president, right? It's all over, isn't it? Isn't it? I've heard more than my share of that sentiment in the year since this book came out. We are very anxious, it seems, to get past the story, get past whatever makes us uncomfortable. And race has always been one of the things, better or worse, that makes us uncomfortable in this country for very good reason. It always has this power that it holds up over us. We go from zero to 60 on the misunderstanding meter instantly. Just ask you know, Henry Louis Gates Jr. or the Cambridge policeman or any number of people who've gotten caught up in that little tripwire this week, Michael Steele. So I laugh when people tell me they're colorblind because to me, that pretty much means that they're blind. I had a guy call me up once on the radio show and say he was so proud of his father-in-law because he's, he's, he had become so open-minded about things and he lived in St. Louis. And I said, oh, really? How's that? He said he took his children to see Avatar. And when the kids asked him afterward, I really like those blue people, the grandfather responded, what blue people? <laughs> <laughs> That's just blind. <laughs> Color blindness doesn't even work. For better or worse, it's the first thing people always notice about you. The secret is not not to notice it. The secret is not to use it against or hold it against someone. Before I went into television, I used to have a little fun. I would call people up on the, t on the great phone and ask to interview them and, and speak in my best, you know, King's English. And then they would meet me and be shocked to discover I was black. And there was this moment where they would pause and say, but. And they catch themselves and realize they couldn't say what had come to their mind. And it always gave me that half a beat advantage over them. I could move right in for the kill. I tell you all these stories not because I'm obsessed necessarily with race, but because they provide a useful lesson about the way we talk and about the way we exchange and the way we insult. The minute you call someone a name, the minute you accuse someone of the worst possible meaning and income, you call them a racist, the conversation shuts down. You're never going to have another conversation. You need to lead by example. Leading by example means 
setting that example for anyone who might be watching. And that means for our kids. It's about building a platform so that they can follow you, a set of steps so they can climb up. How happy all of our ancestors would be to know that these days for so many of us, the tough part of ordering our lives is setting priorities and making choices, not just trying to get the seeds in the ground. Building our lives, building our careers, living honorable lives, working hard to give our children all that we think they deserve. How sad so many of our ancestors would be to know that for so many of us, the choices are still out of reach. But it's the choice about working hard for our children that keeps us up at night, isn't it? It's, we don't wanna break down these walls and bust through the glass ceilings only to discover that they'd rather not really follow along behind us or sort of the next level. And so many of our sons and our daughters buy into all kinds of limits. They buy into limits uh, imposed by situation and economics and also by race, no matter what their background happens to be. So it falls to we women. Half of us have a hammer in one hand and the other half, and half hope in the other. And we're trying to build the stairs for our children, someone else's children, for girls or boys that you mentor, for perfect strangers that you meet on the street or for perfect strangers, in my case, I may never meet, but who happen to be sitting on their living room couch thinking, hmm. We have no choice. We have to live in a world of expectation. We should expect to be treated as equal citizens. Our children should not expect to be inferior. We should all expect that anything is achievable, if not now, then soon. I got into journalism because I'm a pretty basic idealist. I believe that on some level I could change the world, that I could shine some light in dark corners, that I could break down some barriers. Turns out the barriers are still there. Often the corners are still dark, and I've discovered the world is often resistant to change. Debates about war, about peace, about terrorism, they're good, they're good debates for politics and they're good debates for the news business. But I argue that we need to have these debates because they're good for civil society as well. For me, that comes down to boiling it all down every Friday night in Washington week. Our regular stable of reporters include folks who cover the White House, the Pentagon, the, Pentag the State Department, you name it, the economy, <coughs> politics, we've got it covered. And we've got, I think, the best reporters in Washington. Uh, but lately, I've discovered that sometimes the questions are tougher to ask and the issues are tougher to parse. As the news seems to get more urgent and international challenges increase, the questions get hard, they get hard. But being a journalist has taught me about vital connections, like the difference between skepticism and cynicism. I'm a pretty upbeat person. I am skeptical, but I'm not cynical. To be cynical means that you've decided you know the answer, that there's really nothing more to be discussed. That's the debate you see play out so often in our cable television debates, <laughs> where someone chooses a position, argues it, and nothing you say can change your mind. Being skeptical, however, leaves open the possibility that your mind can be changed. If someone gives you a new piece of information that informs it, <coughs> or that there is another third, fourth, fifth follow-up question that you haven't quite answered, and that's where it helps to be skeptical. And it's good to be, have a, it's a virtue to have a little bit of both. And it also taught me that best lessons are not necessarily learned from the people with the most in power and the loftiest titles. People often ask me who is the most important, fabulous, pack, you know, the, uh, person you've ever interviewed. And I often tell them, it's not who you think. It's not a president, it's not a king, it's not some leader. It's often someone, it's a guy like uh, who I met at a Piggly Wiggly grocery store in Ohio once, wearing a union jacket, <coughs> told me he'd been unemployed for 11 months, it was before the 2004 election. And when I asked him who he was gonna vote for, he didn't say, John Kerry, which I expected. He said he was gonna vote for George W. Bush. And I said, well, why is that? Here is this unemployed steel worker, union guy. I formed all the, all the knee-jerk expectations about what he would believe. And he said, I trust the guy. George W. Bush got reelected because of guys like this. He trusted the guy. He voted against, in many ways, people would argue his own self-interest. And I learned a lot from talking to him about what the outcome would be one month later. That's talking to people who are not the usual suspects, who can often teach you so much more than the folks with the talking points. So the essence of the reporter's craft is to learn all you can about something you never, that never, never previously interested you, like Kyrgyzstan. Find a way to make it 
accessible to everyone who bothers to read or to listen to you. And if you can find a way to do it, like I do every night on the news hour, every Friday on Washington Week, you've got one of the best jobs in journalism. So forgive me if after all this time as a journalist, I remain ever the optimist, ever certain that shining that little light, the light of justice and of understanding into the world is hard and it is necessary and ultimately it is very, very satisfying. On that note, I would like to stop and take your questions. Thank you. Thank you.